Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. We're going to start in just a couple minutes from now. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I hope everybody's staying safe out there with all the coronavirus stuff that's going on. I am Colin White, I'm a research scientist at realityengines.ai, and today we're going to give a workshop on deep recommender systems. Um, so, so I'll start with just an intro to realityengines.ai, then I'll give a talk for about 40 minutes on deep recommender systems. And then the next hour, hour 15 minutes, I'll hand it off to my colleague who will show you how to build a recommender system using our service at realityengines.ai. You'll have a, a Google Colab workbook that you can use and follow along. OK, so uh, realityengines.ai is a cloud AI service where you can create deep learning systems yourself. Um, you'll hear a lot more about it later on in this workshop, but basically you just log on to our website, which is realityengines.ai, and you'll see many different uh, use cases. There are a few for recommender systems and uh, a lot for many other types of uh, machine, learning, uh, machine learning problems. And it's really easy to just upload your own data set and then immediately start training an ML model. OK. And, uh, and another thing is we're doing a, a lot of uh, cutting edge deep learning research in, uh, in recommender systems, as well as neural architecture search, debiasing ML algorithms, and also incorporating logic rules into machine learning systems. OK, so uh, now I'll start talking about deep recommender systems. OK, so uh, many of us interact with recommender systems several times a day. Um, uh, whenever we log on to uh, Amazon, Amazon, Netflix, YouTube, Pandora, uh, we're all interacting with recommender systems. Um, anytime you see like a recommendation for what product to look at next or what video to look at next, the recommender system is driving that recommendation. And Netflix reports that about 80% of the content watched by its users come from personalized recommendations. So that means that if the algorithm can improve by just like 1%, 
then they'll see a huge increase in their profits. So recommender systems are a very important area of study for, for many companies. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over just some definitions, uh, the data sets, how to split up your data, and some metrics. Then I'll go over a few baselines and then get into deep learning techniques. Okay, so if you've seen other machine learning use cases like classification or regression, there's usually just a single data set. Recommender Systems typically has three data sets. So let, let's think about an example of like Netflix. So there, there's a set of users and a set of movies. So the first data set are the user attributes. So this will be like the, the, a person's age, where the, the city they're in, and maybe uh, their taste in movies. And then, uh, then the item attributes will be attributes of the movies. So, so like the average rating, what year the movie came out, and that sort of thing. Maybe the genre of the movie, and so on. And then the third data set is the interaction data. And this is the most important. So we can imagine a, a huge matrix where the users are the rows and the movies are the columns. And then every entry in this matrix is, is going to be some sort of interaction data. The simplest thing would just be uh, Boolean, like whether or not the user interacted with that, with that movie, whether the user watched the movie. Or it could be a rating, or it could be the time at which the user watched the movie and also a rating. Or, or something even more complicated. And one thing to note is that this is typically very sparse because any given user will have watched a very tiny fraction of this whole set of movies on Netflix. And similarly, any movie will only be watched by a very small fraction of the users. And the goal of a recommender system is to output ratings or rankings for, for these unseen entries. So we might want to Maybe Tom has not yet seen a James Bond film, so we want the recommender system to, to uh, guess what rating Tom would give that movie if he had watched it. We can also, something very similar is outputting rankings. So we might want to output the top 20 movies that Tom would like that he has not yet seen. Okay, so, uh, okay, so another thing to note is that this this recommender system data can either be temporal or non-temporal. For instance, for instance, uh, Amazon has very temporally ordered data because a user might log on and then look at three different coffee makers and then two different coffee filters, and then every month after that, look at different types of coffee beans. So the, the data has a lot of temporal patterns, whereas something like Netflix is a lot less temporal. Maybe there's still a little bit of temporal data, like a user uh, might, might have some certain trends, like get into fads where they watch action movies. But, but in general, a user will have tastes, and it's much, there's much less temporal ordering than something like Amazon. So these, just uh, the takeaway is that there are different types of recommender system problems, uh, temporal or non-temporal. Okay, so next I'll talk about how to split up our data into train, validation, and test splits. So if you've seen something like classification or regression, it's really easy. You just randomly split up your data into 80-20 for train and test. But for recommender systems, we have this huge matrix. So it's a bit less unclear, a bit less clear. So for non-temporal data, it's still fairly simple. For every user, we just look at all the items they've interacted with and then split these up uh, 80, 10, 10 into train, validation, and test. For temporal data, we need to be a little bit more careful to make sure we don't have data test data leakage. So typically what we can do is uh, select points in time that give 80, 10, 10 splits for all the interactions that occurred before and after those time splits. OK, and then the data points here will be a user and all the all the movies they've interacted with up until that period in time. And the goal will be predict to predict the next movie they interacted with. So so actually if a user has interacted with k movies in the training set, we can create k minus one training points by taking all k movies, cutting off the, the last one, 
and cutting off the last two and so on. And then we'll always be trying to predict the next one in the sequence. Okay. Okay, so next I'll talk about metrics. How do we evaluate recommender systems? Okay, so the two simplest ones are top end precision recall. So pre precision is, uh, so say we have the, the uh, true top 10 movies that the user interacted with next. And then we also have the predicted top 10 from our recommender system. Precision is just the percent of the true top end that are in the predicted top end. Recall is pretty similar, but it's just opposite. It's the percent of the top 10 predicted items that are also, that are also in the true top 10 items in the test set. OK, so NDCG is pretty similar to precision, but it gives a higher weight to the higher ranked items. So it's more important if we get the user's number one pick correct versus like their number 100 pick. So it just weights these items based on how they appear in the user's true ranking. OK, and finally, we have coverage. And this is a measure of the uniqueness of the items that that are recommended to each user. So you can imagine a recommender system that just outputs the most popular items to every single user. So that, that recommender system won't be that interesting because uh, it, it's, it's not taking into account the user's individual preferences. And you might say like, well, what if there is a recommender problem where that is the right answer? But, but if, if all we need to do is recommend the most popular items to everybody, then we don't really need a recommender system in the first place. So coverage is often like a very good measure of how well a recommender system is doing. And, and yeah, it's just a measure of how unique each item is for every individual user's uh, recommended items. OK. So now I'm going to go over some, uh, some baseline techniques for recommender systems. So the simplest possible thing we can do, which I talked about on the last slide, is just recommend the most popular items to every single user. OK, so that's often used as like, uh, the easiest baseline when evaluating recommender systems. Next up, we have user or item k nearest neighbor. So user k nearest neighbor is like, say Alice has watched these eight movies. And then we notice that Bob has also watched seven of those eight movies and has watched these two other movies. Then we can recommend those two other movies to Alice, because they probably have similar taste. And then related to that is item k nearest neighbor. So this, is, this means Bob has has uh, looked at this document that he really likes. And then we look at documents that are very similar to that document and also recommend those to Bob. OK, so next we have matrix factorization. This was an extremely popular algorithm 10 or 15 years ago. If you've heard of Netflix challenge, matrix factorization was featured in that challenge. Um, so the idea is that we have this really sparse matrix um, and and the idea is that we assume that this matrix is low dimensional. And w under that assumption, we can actually uh, we can approximate the matrix as a product of these two thin rectangular matrix matrices. So if our full matrix is m by n, then we can approximate it by the multiplication of a m by d times d by n matrix matrices. And uh, some intuition is that we're basically assuming that uh, there are, there's a small set of D features that can that can approximate the matrix. So so each user has some unknown features like like uh, are they under 25 and do they like action movies? We don't actually know what the features are, but we assume that they exist and that they can perfectly reconstruct the full matrix. So then so then all we need to know are the features of each user in order to know whether or not they'll like any given movie. OK, and, and so once we uh, make those assumptions, it turns into a huge optimization problem to find the best matrices U and V that can model our, our true matrix. OK, so just a couple other fine points about recommender systems. So typically in practice, there's, there's a cold start issue. And this means, say, say Netflix has a good recommender system, but then a new user comes along. 
and so they have no history at all. So how do we start recommending movies to this new user when we have no information to start with? And similarly for, for new movies that come along, they have not been watched by any user, so it's hard to, uh, to get the ball rolling, get, figure out initially how to fit them into the recommender system. Um, and typically these, these will need to be dealt with by a totally separate algorithm that heavily relies on the user features or item features. And just one other fine point is that uh, many of these recommender system problems are very different from one another. I already talked about earlier how Amazon is very different from Netflix because of temporal versus non-temporal data. So typically, uh, compared, compared to another type of machine learning problem like, like image classification, recommender system problems will be very separate. They might be like user, user interaction heavy or item interaction heavy. So, so typically AutoML will be very beneficial. This means like if you have a good meta algorithm that can find the best model or find the best hyperparameters automatically, this will be much more beneficial for recommender systems than for something like image classification. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about deep learning techniques for recommender systems. Okay, so if you remember the matrix factorization algorithm, um, the first thing we can do when designing a deep learning algorithm is just replace that huge multiplication with a neural network. And this is called neural collaborative filtering. So the idea here is that instead of, instead of trying to solve an optimization problem to find these two thin uh, matrices that multiply to the big one, let's just get a neural network to learn the best latent learn the best embedding for each user and items. So, so the, the neural network will automatically find the best features of the users and items. OK, and there are many variants on this method and many generalizations of this method. Another popular generalization is called neural matrix factorization. And that's when we ensemble neural collaborative filtering with standard matrix factorization. Another uh, generalization that I think is pretty cool is, um, is uh, you can actually uh, have complex valued latent vectors to, to get a more expressive uh, multiplication. So again, there are many different types of uh, this neural collaborative filtering idea. OK, so, uh, so now I'll get into, uh, uh, so, so Actually, all the algorithms I've explained so far were, were non-temporal algorithms, where they didn't take into account the ordering of the user history. So now I'll start talking about some algorithms that do take into account the ordering. So you can think of uh, like Amazon will be doing something more with the temporal data, because there, there, are, there are more temporal structures to learn. OK, so typically with temporal data, with machine learning, we with deep learning, we would use RNNs, recurrent neural networks. And here I'm going to talk about a gated recurrent, gated recurrent unit, which is a type of RNN for temporal data. And the idea is that um, we, the user has a, a sequence of items, and the GRU will take in the sequence and learn the temporal structure. For instance, if, if uh, we're talking about Amazon data and the user buys coffee beans once a month, then this GRU will learn that trend and start to recommend coffee beans every single month. OK, so this is what it looks like in the, uh, in the full end-to-end. -end. So on the left side, we have a user and all of their item history that's ordered. Then we first run, it, run all the items through an embedding layer. And then we run it through the GRU from the previous slide. And then we run, it, then we run the output of the GRU through some fully connected layers. And the output is going to be predictions for all the items that the user has not yet interacted with. And, and the goal is going to be to predict the next item that the user interacts with. So, so the ground truth will just, be a, will just be a vector with a single one for the item that the user does interact with and zeros everywhere else. And our predictions will be probabilities. So the probability that this is the next item that the user interacted with. And so then we can just take the cross-entropy loss and back-propagate this loss through the neural network. 
uh, a standard uh, training of the neural network. Okay, but another thing to point out is that these predictions can actually be used to rank all items uh, that the user has not yet interacted with. So, so often it's the case in recommender systems where instead of, instead of just outputting a single rating, we, we want the full ranking of all the items the user has not yet interacted with. So in this type of approach, we, we can get that for free with this prediction vector. vector. OK. So I'll talk about one more approach, and this is self-attention. So this is very similar to the previous approach, but we replace the GRU with the attention layer. So if you're familiar with natural language processing literature, a similar thing happened there where people were using RNNs all the time, and then they, then they realized they can just use attention layers and they actually work better. So similar things true for recommender systems. We can just replace the RNN with attentions, with attention layers. Okay, so the intuition here is that the intention layer will, will learn what is the most important items from a user's history in making predictions. For instance, if a user on Netflix has watched a few very popular movies, they're probably not that important. But if the user has watched some really niche movies in this specific subgenre, then they're probably very important for predicting what the user will watch next. So this is why self-attention is very promising in, uh, in building recommender system algorithms. OK. So, uh, so just another point on self-attention. Uh, new recommender systems in practice these days are, are getting more complicated with respect to the, the user item interaction data. For instance, say we want to build a recommender system for Airbnb. We might, uh, we might have users' reviews from previous Airbnbs uh, for the user information, and we might have, uh, for, the, for the Airbnbs, we might have images of each apartment. So, so this is very complex data, and we can use self-attention to, to help us out. For instance, if we have an attention layer here, we might connect a user's review mentioning kitchens to an apartment's image of a kitchen. Okay, so self-attention is also very promising for these for these newer types of recommender systems that have a lot a lot more uh, rich data than just just uh, interaction data and temporal data. Okay, so attention approaches seem very promising for in this context. Okay, so that's all I have for the intro to recommender systems. So I talked about the, uh, the problem setup. I talked about some baselines, including nearest neighbor and matrix factorization, and then some non-temporal deep learning approaches like collaborative filtering and, and uh, neural matrix factorization, and temporal approaches uh, such as RNNs and attention-based models. OK, so now I'm going to check if I have any questions in the live stream. Um, OK, so if anybody has any questions, they can, uh, they can just uh, post them in, in the YouTube stream. Um, OK, so I see a few. OK, so actually, I think I can, uh, we, we can, we can uh, reply to these reply to these questions uh, in the chat, and uh, and so right now I'm going to hand it over to my to my colleague Austin, who will help help all of you build recommender systems using our Reality Engines framework. All right, thank you, Colin. Uh, that was a great presentation. And uh, as, as Colin has mentioned, I'm Austin, a senior software engineer here at realityengines.ai. And today I'm gonna to go through setting up a recommendation engine to predict uh, the, the top 50 movies to recommend to a specific user using the realityengines.ai system. 
And we're going to do this all pretty much through the uh, Python client API. Uh, we will jump uh, over to the Reality Engine's website a few times. I uh, will show off a few of the visualizations there. Um, but for the most part, we're going to stay inside of uh, the Reality Engine's recommendations workbook. Uh, so if you want to follow along today, uh, go ahead and type in that short URL, uh, bit.ly slash reality engines. Uh, and that's a capital R and capital E. And I'll give you all just a moment to uh, follow into that link so you can uh, follow along and, and do this yourself. So you have a, a uh, recommendation engine of your own that you can test out and continue to explore. Um, and so just to, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, this, this link is a Google Colab. And a Google Colab is essentially a, a donation from Google to the researcher community to allow people to uh, run code, uh, specifically Python code, uh, inside of a workbook environment. So you can go step by step. And so we can very easily go through uh, the Reality Engine's Python client API and just dig into what, what each of these calls is doing. And we can also visualize some of the outputs and understand what's going on uh, every step of the way. Um, so you will need your Google account, uh, so make sure you have that handy, you're ready to sign in. Um, but once you come to the site, uh, the first thing that you're going to do is actually going to hit the si sign up link here uh, to go to realityengines.ai. Uh, this is a, a special sign up link, it's going to give you a special token. So we are in a uh, private beta at the moment. And so you're going to be one of the first uh, group of people to come onto our platform. Uh, so congratulations and welcome. Uh, we look forward to having you test out our service. Um, so go ahead and click on that link. And that's going to uh, bring you to the Reality Engine sign up page. Um, so what you're going to do is either sign up with your GitHub account, sign up with Google, um, or use your email uh, and password. If you use your email and password, you will have to uh, do a validation step. Um, so it'll just take a couple more moments. Uh, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and click sign in with my uh, Google account. And once I do that, I should be taken to the next screen. And so I'll give you all a moment to go ahead and create your account, uh, especially for those of you who are who will be using your uh, email and password. Um, so the first thing that you're going to do is actually create an organization. Uh, the organization inside of Reality Engines is just a, a way for you to collaborate with your coworkers uh, and, and create uh, models and deployments uh, together. Um, but for, for now, we'll just go ahead and hit skip this for now. And so that will go ahead and just create a placeholder organization for you, um, just for, for you personally. And so this will bring you to the Reality Engines dashboard. Uh, so here we have a, a blank dashboard. We haven't created any projects yet. Um, but the first thing that we're going to do once we're inside of the, the Reality Engines platform is go ahead and go to the top right and hit admin. Um, I've also provided a link in the uh, workbook, which will take you directly here. Um, but we're essentially going to go to the API keys tab. So again, uh, once once you've created your account, uh, you'll click on the top, top right, you'll click on admin. And then on the left hand side, there will be a tab for API keys. And so what we're going to do is just go ahead and create an API key. And this will allow you to authenticate your requests for the Python tutorial. So this will uh, allow the, yeah, the Python client to make requests, create projects, uh, train models uh, throughout the workbook. And so I'm going to give everyone just a moment to go ahead and uh, grab your API key. So you can go ahead and copy this value, or you can hit copy on the dashboard here. Uh, and if you are following behind, uh, feel free to let us know in the the chat. 
uh, in the live chat and the live stream, and I'll I'll definitely make sure to to slow things down and uh, let you catch up. Um, we also have a team of people on the live chat that are uh, there to assist and help, and also provide uh, links as well. All right, so now that we have our API keys, we're going to go ahead and switch back to the workbook. And as I had mentioned, uh, this is the, the workbooks are a service from Google that allows us to uh, run Python code on a cloud computer. Uh, so all of this is running in the cloud on a computer somewhere in Google Cloud Services. Uh, so you don't need to install Python or, or do anything else uh, in order to get this running. So all you have to do is basically the structure of this workbook uh, will have like text and descriptions, uh, and then we'll have code blocks. And in these code blocks, all you have to do really for the most part is just hit play. Um, and so we're just going to go step by step through this workbook. Uh, we'll and I'll, I'll talk everyone through everything. So if you want to just put the, the live stream into a separate tab, uh, I'll make sure to, to tr be descriptive and, and talk through everything. Otherwise, feel free just to follow along uh, in, in the video and we'll, we'll get going here. Um, so the first thing you're going to do uh, once you start hitting play, uh, this is going to install the Reality Engine's Python client. Um, it's going to ask if you want to actually run this because uh, this workbook was authored by me. Um, so go ahead and hit run anyway. So this is going to uh, allocate and connect to a cloud machine. Um, to run this code for you. And so um, after a moment here, this is going to install the Python client. I'll just give it a moment and it's now successfully installed onto the cloud machine. So we should be able to go ahead and uh, continue along. So the, uh, the next step in the workbook is we're going to actually import uh, two libraries. Uh, one of them is pandas. Uh, so pandas is just a library that we're going to use uh, to download and preview our data set files that we're going to use. Um, and then pretty print is just a visualization tool. So we'll, we'll pretty print some output, uh, make it easier to read inside of this workbook. So we'll go ahead and hit play on that. And that will initialize both of those libraries. All right. And now the next step uh, is just to input your API key. So we have a little field here. Uh, that's prompting for your API key. So if you've gone ahead and created your Reality Engines account and created the API key, um, there's also a link here if you want to, uh, if you already lost it in your clipboard, uh, this will take this link will take you directly back to your dashboard uh, and so you can get your API key. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and just paste your API key into the field. And once you hit run, uh, that API key is then saved, and then we can continue to use it inside of this workbook. And then finally, the last step for getting set up is just to import uh, the Reality Engine's client and then pass it our API key. And so this will allow us to start making requests uh, and start actually creating projects and importing data sets into our Reality Engine's account. So now go ahead and click run on that. All right. And so the first part that we're going to, or the first step we're going to take is to actually create a project inside of reality engines. And so uh, the, the reality engines project is essentially just a container. Uh, it holds all of your data sets. Uh, it's also very use case specific. Uh, and so we, define use cases inside of reality engines to essentially solve very specific uh, business problems. So everyone uh, who's ever had or <laughs> ever attempted to create a AI model uh, using data sets, you'll find that uh, your, your business data never seems to exactly fit uh, what you're trying to solve. And so what, what you really need to, to figure out is like, how, how does my data actually feed into and fit into this uh, problem? And so we've defined uh, very specific problems that each business might face such that we can help guide you and lead you into exactly how you're supposed to be using your enterprise data to actually create a very, or to create and solve the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, so you can actually see the uh, available use cases inside of our platform by calling first client uh, dot list use cases 
and you can view all of the available use cases as well as some descriptions uh, over what each use case does. Uh, the use case that we're interested in today is the user recommendations. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, what we're going to do today is we're actually going to recommend movies to a user. And so uh, we're going to start with three different data sets. We have a user's data set, we have uh, a movie's catalog data set, and then we have a data set that's filled with uh, interactions between the users and the movies. And so what we're going to do is just hit play on the next uh, code block here, which is to set the use case to user recommendations. And as I had mentioned, uh, each use case has different requirements inside of Reality Engines. And so what we're going to do is call the describe use case requirements. This is just a quick way to reference exactly what the requirements are for a use case inside of Reality Engines. Uh, so you'll see uh, in the response to this call that we have uh, a few required data sets. So we have the data sets uh, user item interactions. As I had mentioned, we're going to be uploading a data set which has the movies and the users and the interactions between them. Um, and so this, this uh, user item interactions requires you to have a user ID, uh, an item identifier, and then some sort of timestamp. So when did the user actually rate or uh, interact with the, the item? And then the second data set is going to be the item attributes. So this is just your movie catalog and metadata about the movie. It could be the movie title, uh, also be uh, the genres or when the movie was released. So just all the all the information about your, your movie catalog. And the only required column in here is going to be your item ID. So this could be uh, just a unique identifier for the movie. And then finally, the last data set for this use case is the user attributes. So this is any and all information about the user. The only thing that we, we require we actually require is the user ID, but if you have information about uh, a bunch of user attributes from the age to uh, when they signed up to income level, everything uh, could be useful. Uh, the, the magic of deep learning is the fact that you don't need to know what features are important. All you need to do is uh, give it to the system and the deep learning uh, algorithm will actually go and determine what's the most important features uh, to actually making a prediction. So the last step here, uh, we're actually just going to go ahead and create that project container. Uh, so we're going to call uh, the uh, the Python client dot create project uh, with the name movie recommendations and the use case of uh, user recommendations. And so now we have our project, and so we can start or go ahead and start uploading data to Reality Engines. All right, so uh, actually adding data sets to your project. So uh, Reality Engine's uh, AI has already has connectors for uh, reading data directly from AWS S3 or Google Cloud Storage. Um, and we're, we're continuing to work on more connectors uh, to easily read your data from, from where it's at and uh, then create models uh, from that data. But we also support uh, direct data set upload. And so for this workshop, uh, we're not going to go through the process of linking your Amazon S3 bucket um, and, and reading data from there. We're just going to go ahead and download the data sets to this workshop machine. And then we're going to upload the data sets directly to Reality Engines. And so as I had mentioned, we have three data sets. And all that we need to do is uh, identify which data set uh, belongs to which of the data set requirements uh, for this use case. So uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, three different uh, use case requirements, which is the item attributes, the user attributes, and the user item interactions. And so we're going to go ahead and start uh, downloading uh, the uh, each of these data sets. Uh, so by clicking on each of these boxes, uh, you'll download uh, uh, download these 
to the, the workshop machine and save it to a CSV file. So that way we'll be able to upload it in just a moment. Um, but while we're here, we can go ahead and inspect each of these files uh, and see the, the uh, some sample data from each of these. Uh, so as you can see, for the movies data set, we have the movie ID, we have the uh, movie name, and then the, the genres uh, for the movie. So it can be, uh, we, we support uh, multi-categorical, so uh, each of these will be automatically uh, processed to be separate categories. Uh, and so we can uh, then take in that information and use it as part of our deep learning model. Um, and as Colin has mentioned, this information that can can then be used as part of the cold start. So if you launch a new movie by giving it uh, just the genre, we can automatically start incorporating it as part of our recommendations without any users having previously interacted with that movie. All right, and the next data set, if you go ahead and click on the play in the next box, we have uh, the user ID. Uh, and then some metadata about each of the users. So you have uh, gender, uh, age, range, as well as the occupation and zip code. Um, so all of this information can be used as part of our recommendation service. And last but not least, we actually have the user uh, in movie ratings data set. All right, and so in uh, in this data set, we just have the user ID, the movie ID, and the rating uh, that the user had given to the movie, uh, as well as the timestamp when they had actually made that rating. Uh, and you'll notice that we have uh, just ratings of five and four. Uh, we just simplified the ratings for the movie lens data set. Uh, so the rating of five is, means that they liked it, and rating of four means they didn't. So we, we collapsed uh, all of the low star ratings. So it's, it makes it more binary. Uh, either they liked the movie or they did not. And so... Um, we then have all three of our data sets loaded onto our workshop machine. Um, I did receive a uh, question uh, to go down, or it's time to, to go back to the API keys, um, just to, to cover that real quick in, in case uh, I went a little bit too quickly here. Um, if you want to authenticate uh, and, and create your API key, uh, again, just to sign up for your account, uh, we have the, the special link here on the sign up. Uh, so this will give you a special sign-up token to create your Reality Engines account. And once you've gone through and created your account, uh, you can go ahead and just click on the API Keys dashboard page. And uh, this will take you directly to the API Key dashboard where you can create your key. And again, I'll, I'll quickly show that real quick. Um, so going back over, uh, that link will bring you to the API Keys page. And you can just click on the Create API Key uh, button, and that will create your API key. You copy that value inside of the API key, um, or you hit the Action Copy button, and that will copy it directly to your clip, uh, clipboard. And then once you've created your API key, you come back uh, to the workbook. And then just follow follow along and click through each of the steps. Uh, so just hit play on each of these buttons. Um, and then when prompted uh, for the third code block here, uh, paste your API key here and then hit play. Um, if you click play first, uh, it's going to set your API key to an empty string. Um, so make sure that you paste your API key and then press play. Um, if you mess up and, and you set your API key to, to null, just go ahead and uh, hit that play button again. That will actually rerun the code inside of that block. Um, so, and then uh, you should be able to just go ahead and hit, hit this next box and uh, just go ahead and follow along uh, navigating through each of these code blocks. 
and we'll get back to uploading the data to reality engines. Um, so this is a, a bit of a larger code block, but it's, it is fairly simple of what we're doing here. So essentially for each of our data sets, uh, we're going to call create a data set uh, from a local file. Uh, so what this is doing is going to create a, a data set object inside of reality engines. Uh, the first parameter here is just the, the name of the data set. And it's, in the first case, we have uh, movies. Uh, we're going to give it the project ID we want to upload the data set to. Uh, and so in this case, we, we have our movies uh, project. Uh, and so we're going to give it the project ID from the movies project. And lastly, we want to give it a data set type. And as I had mentioned earlier, uh, the data set type is how we want reality engines to use this data inside of this data set. Um, and so that will, uh, that will allow reality engines to uh, run special detectors to, to be able to detect the information inside of the data set so, uh, such that we are ready to go out of the box. Um, so after you create this, this upload, uh, we're, we'll then open the file uh, using Python. And then using the upload reference, we're just going to call upload file on that file. And so that'll automatically take care of uploading it to reality engines. And reality engines will then store that data set. Um, so I'm going to hit play uh, while I continue to talk through this, as it will take a moment to, to upload each of these data sets. Um, and so as this goes, it will actually uh, go through and we have print statements to say when the data set's actually been uploaded. Um, so again, as I mentioned, we're uh, creating the upload instance. It will then open that file that we had saved earlier using pandas. And then it will upload the data set to reality engines. Um, and then it'll do it again for the user's upload or the user's data set. Uh, giving it the name users, same project, and then the data set type user attributes. And lastly, I will do it for the uh, user movie ratings data set. Um, so this, in this case, we're calling it user movie ratings, same project, and giving it the data set type user item interactions. And finally, when we are done, uh, we have all three of our data sets uploaded. And so uh, what we're gonna, what Reality Engines is doing as soon as it's uploaded, it's actually gonna go through and process each of these data sets. And so uh, given each data set type, it's going to automatically detect each of the schemas. Um, for each of the attribute data sets, uh, it will process whether or not, uh, or what each column actually means and what kind of data is inside of each, uh, each of these data sets. And so just to give an example, uh, we'll go ahead and hit play on the next box. And so for each of the data sets that we've uploaded, uh, we'll, we'll call get schema uh, for this project uh, and this data set. So each of our uh, data sets then we can inspect, okay, so for the movies data set, which had the columns movie ID, movie, which is the name, as well as the genres, uh, we see that the, uh, the the column mapping was determined to be an item ID for the movie ID, and uh, the data type was an identifier. Uh, and so then inside of our genres, for uh, as another example, we have the uh, data type categorical list. So we know that each of the, or that our reality engines automatically detected that inside of the column of genres, uh, it's not just, or it's taking each of the uh, the genres and splitting it based on the pipe, uh, and so we can actually detect that it's not uh, for each data set. It's not drama thriller. It is drama slash thriller, um, and so we can then categorize each of these uh, appropriately, uh, and so we can have multiple categories inside of one column. Um, and then inside of our user schema, we have the user ID. Uh, which was our identifier. We have the gender, which was marked as categorical. Age, uh, since it wasn't using discrete ages, but rather age ranges, it detected this, uh, this column as categorical. 
uh, which just means that it was grouped into, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, the, the age was a, a group. The occupation was again a categorical and zip code was also categorical given that there is a discrete number of zip codes. Um, finally, uh, we have the user ratings data set. Uh, and so we have the four columns that were detected inside of that data set. So we have the user ID, which again was mapped appropriately to the user ID. Uh, and it's important that we uh, detect this correctly as what, what's going to happen as part of training is we're actually going to join the user movie ratings and then join appropriately onto the, uh, the user schema as well as the movie schema based on the user ID. So it will automatically apply the uh, appropriate identifier to join on the auxiliary data sets. And then lastly, we've got the or, and then we have the ratings as well as the timestamp. And so this is, again, our temporal data. So we need a timestamp to be able to know when the user rated each of the, the movies uh, such that we can use that information for giving timely uh, predictions. So if they're suddenly rating a lot of uh, uh, Netflix movies about uh, diseases and sp or disease spread, we can take in that information and say, we should show them more of this uh, because they're rating it well, or we should stop showing them this because they, they are suddenly much less interested. Maybe it hits a little bit too close to home right now. Uh, so now, now we have all, all three of our data sets uploaded to Reality Engines, uh, and it's uh, done processing. Uh, so we can go ahead and make sure that we our, our uh, project is good to go, that we've met all the requirements, all the required data sets, as well as all the appropriate columns in each of the data sets. Um, all we have to do is call the movies project dot validate. Uh, and so that's just going to check with reality engines. It's going to check uh, whether or not this, this project's valid. Uh, if we did have errors, such as a missing data set, or we were missing a column inside of one of our data sets, so let's say we forgot the user ID inside of our movie ratings data set, uh, it would tell us here in the data set errors. Um, but in this case, we have all the information we need to uh, go ahead and start training. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and hit that next box. Uh, and so that next box is going to go ahead and start training the model. And so by calling train model, uh, it's going to start the, the, the training process. Uh, and so this is going to create a, a model object here. Uh, so we have um, a new model. Uh, it has a, it's a personalization AutoML uh, recurrent neural network model. And it gives us a little more information. So our model config, we're doing the test split uh, with a 10%. So we're, we're cutting off about 10% of the data uh, to use as testing and, and validation. Um, and so this, this process will take a little bit of time. Um, so I'm going to ask that you actually don't hit the uh, movies model wait for evaluation for now. If you did, don't worry. Um, go ahead and hit stop um, on that call. So if you hit that, uh, you can go ahead and stop. They'll throw an error. That's fine. Um, basically, this next call for wait for evaluation is going to uh, continually pull the reality engine service and uh, it will block your, your code execution at that call until we're done uh, processing the, the data set, or I'm sorry, processing the model. Uh, and so it'll, it'll finish training, it'll then evaluate the model to get the metrics. Once that's all done, uh, we can then uh, continue on to deploy the model into production. Um, but for now, we're going to go ahead and uh, pause on the notebook. Um, and I'm actually going to uh, switch gears a little bit here uh, and switch over to the Reality Engine's uh, UI. So while our models are training, go ahead and pop over to the product. Um, so this is the uh, Reality Engine's UI, as I mentioned. Uh, so this is all the same information that you're seeing in the API. Uh, so we have the uh, three data sets here. Uh, we have the user user item interactions, the catalog data, and the user attributes. Um, we have the each, uh, each of the data sets have, of course, the required columns. And you can see that we uh, appropriately tagged each of the columns. And we also have uh, 
uh, all the uh, more information about each of the data sets. Um, if we wanted to go ahead and switch up uh, the columns, let's say that Reality Engines uh, didn't get uh, one of the columns correct, uh, you can go ahead and change it. So if, for example, movie was your ID, even though you had movie ID, let's say that movie name was going to be your unique, unique identifier, we could switch that uh, to the identifier. Um, of course, we're going to get a validation error because it doesn't match. Uh, we're actually, uh, it, it's a, a mismatch between the data sets. So I'm going to go ahead and set that back. Um, and so I'll, of course, change the data type appropriately to an identifier. Uh, we can also click on the raw data tab. Uh, this allows us to explore our data sets. Uh, so if we wanted to see uh, a little bit or what was imported, what does this data set actually have inside of it? We can uh, view uh, some metadata and information about the data set so we can see the number of rows. We've got about 600,000 rows. Um, so we have a lot of user ratings here for, for our movies. Um, and finally, we have the data exploration tab. This is just a little bit of a, visualiz a visualization and summary of your data sets. So for each of your data sets, you can see uh, a chart of the shape of the data. So of course, user ID, since it's going from uh, one to all the way to 6,040, uh, it's just a, a steady climb. Um, ratings, obviously we have just two values. So we have uh, a bit more on the side of uh, fours rather than fives. Um, and finally, the timestamp uh, climbs a bit. And uh, again, just a Temporal data, we obviously had a uh, large user growth here because we, we have a lot of timestamps of similar time. So our, our platform was growing pretty fast at the end. Um, and yeah, so after after all of that, um, I, I had already uh, trained a model ahead of time. So I can go ahead and show you some metrics. Uh, so using, using this system, uh, I was able to uh, train both the uh, the deep learning model, as well as use the popularity baseline. So I was able to, to using or using the uh, live test data, we scored the baseline, which was just using the the most popular movies and always uh, always recommending the most popular movies on the platform. Uh, we then scored uh, both of these models. The uh, uh, on each of these counts, uh, we we did score better. Uh, using the deep learning model. Uh, so you can see that the uh, normalized discounted cumulative gain uh, was a 0 0.31. And again, for each of these, we're, we're trying to get to a score of one uh, it is a perfect score. And uh, it's it's always good to, to move in an extra couple points uh, uh, for each of these. Um, the most important thing to, to note is that our item coverage for the AutoML network is uh, extremely high. Uh, so the popularity baseline uh, is only going to recommend the top 50 movies. So it it uh, it leaves 98% uh, of your catalog untouched because uh, you're never going to recommend that back catalog of 98%. Uh, for our deep learning model, we're actually recommending 61% of the catalog. So you're not only getting uh, pretty good recommendations, uh, better than uh, better than just uh, recommending the top top 50, you're actually uh, getting good recommendations and also utilizing your, your backlog of catalog. So you actually have a, a pretty good uh, coverage. So people are discovering new items rather than they, they just see the top 50 and then say, okay, I watched the top 50 and, and never see anything new. Um, and then our uh, recall and precision as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this was trained ahead of time. So we can go ahead and go ahead and uh, uh, make some predictions on this model. Um, so in, so I've uh, deployed this model, which means I can go ahead and make predictions on it. So I can enter in a user ID uh, or just select one here. Um, and then uh, what, what this is going to do is actually go ahead and uh, make predictions for uh, the next movies for this user to see. So given this user ID, I'm going to see the user's history. Uh, so you can see that they previously watched or uh, previously watched the, uh, the gold, uh, Goldfinger, the Exorcist, Star Wars Episode 4, 
um, Alien. And what we're going to recommend to them is to watch uh, The French Connection, 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, Deer Hunter, Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, if I pick another random user from this list, uh, this person is a little bit similar, seems a uh, sci-fi and, and fantasy. Um, so let's see if we can get a different a user with a little bit different background. So this one's a little bit uh, war movies. So we've got The Patriot and Gladiator. Um, Halloween, so we have more of the X-Men and Mission Impossible, so a little bit more of the action movies rather than the sci-fi movies that the the other user was uh, getting recommendations. So this this definitely seems to be uh, doing pretty good. Um, and again, uh, if we wanted to do this through the API, uh, we have a predictions API tab, so this will uh, show you how you can make these calls using the Python client. Uh, as well as just see an example output from or by just hitting run. Um, but I have, for this, I'm actually going to jump back to the notebook. Uh, and so while our, our models are continuing to train, uh, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of the, of the workbook. Um, so before we cover the other parts here, uh, as I mentioned, I've, I previously trained this model, so I, I uh, created a deployment. And so essentially a deployment is just spinning up infrastructure for hosting the model. And so this allows us to make real-time predictions in a speedy fashion. Uh, and so what this allows us to do is then uh, we create a deployment token. Uh, this token just authenticates the requests to the deployment. And so uh, this allows me to embed this inside of a UI or a user application, or I could use it internally as well. Uh, but that way it's not tied to the API key, so you can't go ahead and create new projects using this, this token. Uh, so using uh, a, a brand new client so we don't have any API key in it, we can call get recommendations uh, with the deployment token as well as the deployment ID. Uh, which I've hard coded in here or in each of your workbooks, so you can go ahead and make predictions, um, and then you can query it with uh, just the user ID. And by hitting play here, that's going to go ahead and fetch the 50 uh, recommendations for the user. Uh, you can of course change this. Uh, we have additional parameters in here, uh, which allows you to uh, modify how many movies you're actually going to request, um, but Obviously, this is uh, super usable for a machine, as you can just join on the movie ID and then display the appropriate uh, uh, movie icon inside of your Netflix application or uh, other movie viewing application. Um, but it's not very handy for us here in, the, in this workshop. Um, so in the next step, uh, we can actually just go ahead and get our movies data that we downloaded earlier. Uh, and go ahead and set the movie ID as the index. And then uh, for each of these predictions, we're going to join on the movie ID, and then we'll print out these recommendations. And so then you can see for each of these movies, we've got the genre, movie, and movie ID. So now we can actually read uh, these movies. So this is uh, presumably what the UI or your application that you're embedding uh, this into is going to be doing um, to actually get the uh, user-readable information. So for user ID 1, we've got American Beauty, Austin Powers, uh, American Pie, Almost Famous. Uh, so again, just showing that we're actually predicting uh, similar, uh, similar genre movies. And uh, if we go ahead and change the user ID in here so we could, uh, again, just switch it, switch it up, give it user ID 101. We'll get a whole new set of predictions. And going back to this loop, uh, we can see the uh, that uh, this this uh, user 101 really liked horror, horror and thriller movies. And so they, they got a whole bunch more horror and thriller movies recommended to them. And uh, so once once your model's done training, you will receive an email uh, alert in your inbox. Um, otherwise, you can 
uh, click the movies model and wait for evaluation. It should take uh, for a data set this size about 45 minutes uh, to an hour to train this deep learning model. Um, but once you're done, uh, once it's done training, you can come back uh, and click on and actually make predictions on your uh, the model on your own model inside of this workbook. Um, but basically, the the next few steps, uh, which I won't be able to show you until the model is done training, uh, is that you can actually call the get metrics, uh, and so you can directly see the metrics uh, that I showed you inside of the UI. And so as as Colin had gone through, uh, the four metrics that we care about for recommendation engines is the normalized discounted cumulative gain. And so that uh, calculates the relevancy of the predicted ranking items uh, compared uh, to the ranking of items in the test set. And the item coverage, it, which is the percent of the catalog that you're recommending to the users in the test set. Uh, the precision, which is uh, the percent of the items from the top ranked items in the test set um, in the predicted top uh, 50 for each user. Uh, so the goal is, and, and then finally the recall, which is the percent of items for uh, the predicted top 50 items and the top 50 items for each of the, or for the test set for each user. And the goal for each of these four metrics is to get as close as one possible. Um, and then after your, uh, you've got your your, mo your trained model, you've gotten the metrics, uh, the only thing you have to do is create a deployment. And again, this just spins up the model inside of a deployment. Uh, during the beta phase, uh, the, the deployment automatically spins back down um, unless you reach out to us at Reality Engines uh, after about 24 hours. Um, but this... Uh, this will allow you, but you can go back in and, and spin it back up. Uh, so we just uh, put it on pause after that time period. Uh, so once you hit create deployment uh, after your model's been trained, it will go ahead and spin up that infrastructure and then you can create your deployment token. And we should just be able to create that actually right now because uh, it's based on the project, it's scoped to the project. So this deployment token can then be used uh, once you have a deployment inside of your project. And then you should be able to then call the get recommendations using your model. Uh, so again, everything that you've seen here inside of the API uh, is also easy to access through the UI. So I can go back uh, to the Reality Engines dashboard. You'll see that you have your movie recommendations project created here. If you wanted to uh, upload your own data and try it again with uh, your own company's data, uh, you can create a new project. Uh, you'll see the list of all of the use cases as well as descriptions for each of these use cases. So we uh, today we went through the personalized recommendations, uh, but there's also plenty of other recommendations. So we have re related items. Uh, which, given a user and a related or and a specific item, it'll actually recommend related items to that uh, specific item. So, as Colin mentioned, if you're on Amazon and you're looking at a coffee maker, maybe you want to recommend uh, or you want to recommend make sure you're recommending things that are uh, related to that item, whether it's other coffee makers for the user to look at or uh, auxiliary auxiliary items like coffee grounds or uh, filters. Um, and then personalized re-ranking of lists uh, is another recommendation system which will allow you to, uh, given a list of items, uh, rank the items in order of relevance to the user. And of course, we have plenty of other uh, business use cases that uh, map to different kinds of problems that you might face inside if, uh, that you're trying to solve inside of your enterprise. Um, and then finally, once you're back in the project, uh, you'll see that your model is uh, training. And once this is done training, uh, a new button will appear uh, in step four, which will allow you to actually deploy that model. Uh, when your model is done training, the uh, models section will be unlocked and you'll be able to view the model metrics as well as uh, see the deployments. And then once you have a deployment, make predictions on, on that deployment. 
And with that, uh, that is about all the content I have for today. Um, so I'm going to check the chat to see if uh, we have any additional questions. But if not, I want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you joining along and, and uh, trying out our system. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll, uh, again, be available on the chat. And afterwards, you can email us. Uh, you can contact me at austin at realityengines.ai or uh, also uh, reach out directly to our CEO, Bindu, at realityengines.ai. I will be happy to, to help you. You can also click this button on the left-hand side of your account. We have the schedule free consultation um, and that will actually allow you, to, or we'll, we'll reach out and help uh, help you create your project inside of realityengines.ai to solve a, a specific problem. And uh, we're, we're always available and happy to help. All right. And it doesn't seem like we have any uh, specific questions uh, in the chat right now. Uh, so I'm going to head and sign off. And again, thank you for joining us and uh, have a good night.